This is a production of Cornell University. So hello, and hello also from my side. It's a great, um, great honor for me to, to be able to uh, presenting here in front of, of this audience. And it's also a great pleasure to, uh, to talk after Lauren because she, um, she quite smoothly prepared the floor for me um, arguing for the 350 ppm target. I will, I will, I will be more radical. <laughs> I will um, argue for, for a 280 ppm uh, target. And, and the, the issues of negative emissions and, uh, um, and uh, current generations, um, I'm happy to, uh, to discuss it in, in the course of, um, of, of uh, after my uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, but my, um, um, so since you are not, uh, not politicians, uh, but uh, um, more academics um, um, audience, my task is not so much to convince you of a certain uh, concentration targets, but to present, uh, to present an argument or a principle by which uh, I think um, uh, um, concentration target should be justified, and uh, I would be happy to, uh, to discuss this uh, principle. Um, and um, well, the question I'm, um, I'm interested in is, is how, to, how to justify such a, um, um, such a climate, uh, climate policy target um, if we accept that uh, we merely know some possible consequences about climate change and do not know probabilities. So how can we justify, um, justify climate targets in a possibilistic framework? I will firstly um, motivate this, uh, this possibilistic reasoning. Then I will discuss uh, two, two versions of a precautionary principle. One I found in the, uh, in the papers of Henry Xu. Um, the other uh, is Steve Garda and I's um, version of the core precautionary principle. I will argue that they, um, that they, um, that they do not allow us to, to justify um, a climate change target. And then I will present a, um, um, a, version, uh, a version of a uh, precautionary principle um, of which I hope that it, it makes it better. Um, so um, usually when we, uh, when we think about, um, um, about climate, um, climate policy goals, we argue in, a, in consequentialistic terms. So we identify consequences of our policy strategies, then evaluate these consequences um, on the basis of different um, normative theories, um, calculate also the costs of the realization of these climate goals, and um, on the basis of this um, information, derive a policy conclusion. The problem is that we there are merely no, uh, or no merely possible consequences of climate change. And the reason for, is, uh, for it is, on the one hand, that the climate sensitivity um, can be, uh, um, um, or we can um, um, assess it only in a broad range, which lies in between one and even double digit um, uh, values like 11, um, 11 um, degree Kelvin, um, for which we have um, uh, we have modeling um, results, um, and the objective probabilities um, for, for the values um, of climate sensitivities are not known. So if um, the IPCC actually reports um, um, density, probability density functions for these values, but these um, um, this, um, density functions should not be interpreted uh, as objective probabilities. They are, they are a result of um, the distributions of model runs and uh, how exactly they should be interpreted is a theoretically quite contested uh, question, but I think uh, um, it is quite clear that they are, do not represent objective probabilities. And the other point is um, that we also cannot, uh, uh, cannot forecast the amount of future greenhouse gases emissions, um, which depend on the future population size, uh, GDP development, technological progress uh, with regard to greenhouse gases, saving uh, technologies, and energy consumption, and energy prices. If all of these of this parameters, um, we, um, well, we, we cannot forecast their development for the next 50 or 100 years deterministically. We uh, do not know also objective probabilities for how they will develop. Um, we can only um, assess possible values and uh, sizes of possible values so that we get um, po uh, possibilistic outcomes of 
what, uh, um, yeah, which, um, which amount of future greenhouse gas emission can be um, emitted. Now, and um, um, facing with these uncertainties, um, um, that, um, that is a situation of um, night and uncertainties, or a situation in which we do not have uh, objective probabilities about future outcomes, um, there are two, um, um, two different approaches how to uh, find a, um, 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 uh, how to how to deal with them, the one of them, and that is um, actually the most uh, the most prominent um, approach, is the probabilistic approach that says so. In the case of uncertainties, uh, where we do not have objective probabilities, there it is under certain circumstances probably to derive subjective probabilities, um, and um, uh, then we can we can use the theory of um, expected utility maximization, uh, maximization in order to to come to uh, to a decision, um, I, um, I doubt that this um, um, that this approach is justified with regard to climate change. I'm sorry that I'm not going into into details and not um, not justifying my um, um, so my my critics um, um, about probabilistic approach. Just because I would like to talk about how to justify uh, how to find a, a solution if we accept that the pro uh, probabilistic approach does not work. So if we have to to justify um, uh, a climate, pro um, climate tragedy without referring, referring to, uh, to probabilities. Um, um, so if you, if, you, um, if you think that probabilistic approach is the best one, then just, um, just follow me as a kind on, a, on the assumption or just being curious um, uh, how, f how far we can come with a possibilistic approach. Um, so now, and um, so if we if we stick uh, or bite the bullet um, of um, justifying a uh, uh, climate policy target on the basis that we know merely possible uh, consequences of climate change, then uh, we have a task to somehow um, so, uh, propose um, a morally justifiable decision principle, um, and that is the task I'm um, trying to address in this talk. So one. Um, a uh, prominent, uh, prominent um, principle uh, that Lauren already uh, introduced today is the precautionary principle. I understand it as a broad idea um, uh, stating that in certain um, situation of uncertainty with um, certain morally relevant consequences, decision makers should choose certain cautious acting options. And that, um, so this formulation of, of the idea of the precautionary principle allows us to, um, well, to de develop a kind of uh, a framework or a structure that, uh, that a precautionary principle um, should, um, should suffice. So it, um, it should um, explicate um, a certain epistemic situation, so in a certain situation of uncertainty. It should say something about, um, about the evaluation of consequences, so um, to which consequences, um, which consequences come around in this situation of uncertainty. And then it should um, somehow explicate or state a certain choice rule that says, under this epistemic circumstances with this um, consequences, that choice rule um, should be chosen. And um, this structure allo um, allows actually uh, for, for an ex explication of a huge variety of, um, of um, precautionary principles. Um, in, um, which, which would um, differ, uh, differ um, with regard to, to the epistemic situation, to the uh, consequences, and to the choice rule. Um, and um, well, now too, um, I will present two, um, two such uh, proposals uh, of explication of such, um, 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 such um, precautionary principles and um, try to, to show why they do not help to, uh, to justify climate policy tragedy. So the one um, I found in um, Henry uh, Shu um, writings, um, which I also now try to, to reconstruct with regard to the structure. So I will try to show the, which epistemic conditions um, 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 are explicated there, the uh, relating consequences of the choice rule. And um, well, <coughs> if the fol uh, so in the version of, of Henry Shu, I interpret the, uh, in the following way. So if decision makers are in the situation of naivety and uncertainty, and if they uh, take into account outcomes uh, with whose likelihood, uh, likelihood is significant, so they should not take all possible outcomes, but uh, 
um, which, which have a certain, certain credibility. Um, and then uh, with regard to evaluating co um, uh, con uh, conditions, um, if it is possible uh, with a significant likelihood that some of the available acts will lead to massive losses. And uh, if there are um, alternative acting options whose outcomes avoid um, these massive losses and whose implementation does not impose excessive cost, then in that, um, in that um, uh, situation, decision makers ought to choose an, um, acting options which avoid uh, the possibility of massive losses. Um, <coughs> Um, uh, this, um, that is um, the, um, also the, um, the, um, some terms are still quite vague, but um, I do not think that that is a problem. Um, my objection to this, um, to this um, version of, of the precautionary principle is that the conditions, um, so the epistemic and uh, uh, evaluating conditions, still do not suffice in order to, uh, to justify the decision rule, so this um, cautious uh, principle to, uh, to avoid massive losses. And the reason is that, uh, that the principle neglects possible benefits from the um, available options. So it is possible that the epistemic and evaluative conditions obtain, but it is not reasonable to act according to the choice rule. And here is an example in which I think it, is, um, it, it applies. Um, so suppose um, we are facing a decision between two options, A and B. The epistemic conditions are that we know that merely possible cons um, we know merely possible consequences from A and B, so we are in, in the situation of anonymity and uncertainty. Uh, we know the consequences uh, host likelihood is significant, but now with uh, with regard to evaluative um, uh, conditions, following situation obtains about the option R. We know in the worst possible case, massive loss losses to future generations are possible, but in the best possible case, um, huge benefits um, to future generations will, uh, will come around. For example, they, they, will, they will be able to reach a distributively just society with a high level of, a quali of quality of life. In the other, um, option B, B um, in the worst possible case, we, uh, we will avoid uh, the massive losses to future generations without imposing high cost to current, genera uh, current generations. Uh, but in the best possible case, we still uh, will, um, so the future generations still will live in a similarly unjust world uh, society as our ones. And um, according to, um, to the precautionary principle um, suggested by Henry uh, Xu, um, option B is morally um, required. That is, um, I think, um, implausible because um, choosing the option B, we preclude future generations of, of an achievement of, a, of the highest social good we could achieve namely um, a, um, a just society. And that, um, at least, um, I, I do not see that, uh, that, it, is, that it follows so, um, so immediately that we are morally required to preclude future generations from this, from this chance. Um, I'm, I'm not, um, not um, stating that option R is morally required. I think um, uh, this, um, uh, so we should tell a little bit more about this, um, this situation in order to be able to to find out what, what actually ought to be done. But it um, only, um, um, so the example serves um, uh, the say, um, the, uh, in order, or I'm, I'm showing in order to show that, um, um, that the consequences of best possible cases are also normatively relevant. <coughs> so, and that is actually, um, actually um, regarded by, um, or accounted for by Gardner's version of of the, uh, of the precautionary principle uh, uh, of the, by the Rawlsian uh, core precautionary principle. Um, I again uh, presented in this structure of, uh, of the epistemic evaluative conditions and the choice rule. The epistemic conditions are quite similar to, um, to, to Henry Schuh's version, so we are in a situation of knowledge and uncertainty. Um, um, also, um, Steve Gardner has a kind of anti-paranoia condition that says not all possible consequences should be um, should be regarded, but only the realistically uh, possible outcomes. Steve Gardner is uh, with regard uh, to, um, to, the, to the explanation of the term realistically possible, um, less precise as Henry Shu, but <clears throat> that's, uh, uh, that's um, not uh, the point now. Um, but the evaluative uh, conditions, they differ. So um, in the Rawls and Core Precautionary Principle, uh, on the one hand, it is realistically possible that some of the available acts will lead to severe harm. 
but the highest possible benefits from the available acts are not significant. And in this um, situation, um, uh, Garadona um, suggests that uh, the acts ought to be chosen um, according to the maximin choice rules. <coughs> and um, so I, with regard to, um, uh, or from the moral uh, point of view, I, I do not have any objections to this, uh, to this version of the um, precautionary principle. Um, so if, um, if, the, um, if this epistemic and evaluating condition, uh, condition apply, then um, it is, um, we are morally required to, uh, to choose according to, to the maximin choice rule. But I do not think that, um, that um, the conditions apply to the issue of climate change. And um, um, especially these two conditions um, do, not, uh, do not apply to the highest possible benefits are significant and uh, uh, we are not, uh, so we, we cannot apply the maximum choice rule. Um, now in order to, to understand why, why these conditions do not apply, I now suggest to, uh, uh, to, consider, to consider the epistemic situation, so uh, to consider what we know uh, uh, or which possibilities we know uh, um, about um, two climate, um, 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 climate policy option, options. So I suggest to just um, uh, for the sake of demonstration to concentrate of, on, two, um, on two options. So one would be to stabilize the greenhouse gases at 550 ppm, and the other one, uh, the more radical, would say uh, we reduce the, the concentration of greenhouse gases on 280 ppm. And um, within the possibilistic approach, we now have to somehow describe um, the, the, the range of possible consequences which I um, try to uh, show by the best and the worst possible case of these um, options. So now let's, um, if we look on the option um, 550 ppm and um, ask ourselves what are the worst possible cases um, in, um, uh, or what uh, worst, uh, worst possible consequences in the case that the climate sensitivity lies in the double digit degree like 11 um, degrees. <coughs> Um, well, I do not know of any, um, um, of any modeling um, or empirical evidence um, with regard to these consequences, so I somehow have to, um, uh, to, pr to propose uh, well possibilistic hypothesis of what can happen. And, um, but one hypothesis um, that the tipping points will be exceeded at, uh, at this um, climate sensitivity, uh, that is um, also in, um, in accordance with uh, Climate, uh, climate science uh, knowledge, and um, um, well, um, the consequences for, of, um, of, um, um, of crossing tipping points um, for, for social systems, they can be in the worst case, well, can lead to humanity's extinctions. Just think of the um, water rise, uh, uh, and, uh, or, or of the rise of the sea level, and all the migration waves will, that will be uh, that will be um, caused by this, uh, leading to political um, instability in um, uh, um, atomic weapons um, powers and leading to, to a nuclear war and this way to humanity's extinctions. Um, in the best case, um, we, can, um, but we, um, we can reach a just global society by, so in the case that, um, that the additional investments in uh, green technology or in order to stabilize the um, uh, the greenhouse gas concentration will boost the economy and this, um, this will uh, benefit the most disadvantaged people and at least we will be uh, juster than we are today. Now if we turn to, um, to, the, to the more ambitious target of, um, of um, uh, stabilizing or, um, the greenhouse gas concentration on the uh, pre-industrial level, then um, actually the consequences of this um, of this um, option are quite similar. So in the worst case, although we will avoid that the tipping points will be crossed, uh, we have to, um, to, uh, to t totally devaluate carbon capital and also to, uh, to remove uh, some greenhouse gases, uh, which is, um, um, for which it is um, necessary to totally change our social and economical order, and that also can lead to, to humanity's extinction because of um, of political destabilization of, um, 
uh, nuclear weapon powers. <coughs> but in the best case, um, we, we could realize uh, what the degrowth movement uh, or the visions of the degrowth movement. So we will devaluate carbon capital, um, the, the economic, uh, the GDP will um, probably will be reduced, but we will use our or will re reorganize our social order such in such a way that we um, or, um, will um, have um, social systems, uh, um, um, well, uh, different social systems and live, um, uh, work less and live in, with, uh, in neighborhood communities with, uh, um, uh, with uh, more, in a more sol solidary uh, society, which will be also even um, be juster or fairer than, than ours. <coughs> and now, um, um, if, you, if you see, though, in the best case, um, somehow in both, uh, in both acting options, we can, we can attain um, a quite important social good, uh, namely um, a just global society. And, I, and that is the point why the, um, uh, the, the second evaluating conditions of um, Gardner's core precautionary principle does not apply. It does matter uh, what will happen in the best possible case. Um, and the second condition that does not apply that, um, that we cannot, uh, uh, our, our foreign knowledge about the consequences is not fine enough in order to, um, to apply the maximum choice rule because in the worst possible case, we, in, all, um, in both cases, uh, with regard to both um, acting options, we know that it will lead to humanity's extinction. So they are, they are somehow on a par. <clears throat> Um, so, and, um, and now um, the problems, um, um, if I summarize my objections to the Rawls and core precautionary principle and why I do not think that it is applicable to the climate principle, it is on the one hand epistemically too demanding, um, so we, we do not know the consequences uh, um, fine enough in order to apply the maximum decision rule, um, and it also presupposes um, a certain morally benign distribution of possible damages and benefits. So it uh, presupposes that if possible damages are huge and possible benefits are negligible, sorry, um, then um, it is, um, um, yeah, um, um, then um, the, the choice rule should be applied. But that is not the case with regard to, uh, to climate change. So there are also the possible damages are huge, but also the, bonif the benefits are, um, are important. <clears throat> now, um, so how could we, how could we um, find a decision if we, um, if we accept this, uh, this epistemic situation? And at least um, if there is a difference um, or if there is a reason in favor of one of the, um, of the acting options, then there should be a difference between, uh, between these options. <clears throat> and uh, the difference I want to to focus on, um, and or, of which I think that it is morally relevant, is that um, there is a difference with regard to interference, interference with natural systems. So um, if we pursue the 280 ppm target, then we definitely preclude that tipping points will be crossed. In the other case, it is still possible that uh, tipping points will be crossed. Um, now, um, why is this, this different, uh, difference morally relevant, um, so um, at first tipping points, uh, thresholds and uh, natural systems for which it holds that if they are exceeded, a certain causal change of further ch um, changes in natural um, systems will be triggered off that cannot be stopped or be controlled behind this threshold. So and um, that is um, actually the reason why I think that this, um, that this uh, point is morally uh, relevant. So, um, um, on the one hand, um, um, the, the crossing of uh, tipping points, uh, by crossing of tipping points, we uh, trigger off a certain non-controllable pro processes with potentially catastrophic impacts. And on the other hand, we uh, trigger off irrevers irreversible uh, processes with um, potentially catastrophic impacts. And now the idea is that in a situation of night and uncertainty, it is reasonable, uh, reasonable to avoid triggering off those processes. Um, and since the, the consequences of this process can also harm others, I will make the point that we are also morally obliged to prevent them. 
Um, now um, I'll try also to, to uh, construct um, um, the precautionary principle according to, uh, to the conditions uh, that, I, uh, uh, that I've stated before. Um, so with regard to epistemic conditions, we are still in the situation of knowledge and uncertainty. And uh, now we take um, um, not only somehow realistically, um, realistically possible, but um, just uh, somehow um, articulated hypothesis about possible consequences. Um, with regard to evaluating conditions, we are in a situation that um, we um, know that the worst possible consequences of our acting options um, can, uh, will be uh, morally harmful, but uh, we cannot order the worst possible or the best possible consequences of the available um, options with regard to their moral value. And now um, we, we need a, th um, a, th um, um, a third kind of, of conditions, which I call a kind of procedur uh, procedural conditions um, that say that um, in this, um, um, there are also, <clears throat> so in this case, we, uh, we should not focus only on the consequences, but on the process that lies in between, uh, so from decision making to, to the consequences. And if we know about this, pro this process, that it is possible that in the course of the real realization of some of the available options, um, a non-controllable cause, um, causal change leading to an irreversible state, um, morally harmful consequences will be triggered off. And um, there are um, other acting options that avoid crossing a tipping point, and th um, that option can be realized without violating, uh, violating moral rights, then um, decision makers ought to choose um, the acting options that avoids um, crossing a tipping point. <laughs> now, um, um, if, um, um, if, you, even <laughs> if you accept that this, um, this version of the precautionary principle is, um, um, is a plausible or legitimate one, it is actually not at all clear which acting option it does, um, it does support for. If, um, if we pursue the 550 ppm uh, goal, um, so we know that, um, that uh, we will not avoid uh, crossing tipping points in natural systems or the possibility. Um, but um, this, um, this option requires um, less intervention, interventions with socioeconomic systems. And with regard to, to the more ambitious uh, target, we, on the one hand, know that the crossing point in natural systems will be, uh, will be avoided, but it requires quite radical transformation of socioeconomic systems. And um, um, so um, can we really, um, um, really know that uh, by making this radical transformation of socioeconomic uh, systems, we won't also um, cause um, or trigger off um, um, a kind of tipping points with consequ um, catastrophic consequences. And um, <coughs> to this question, I do not have, um, um, have um, a full-fledged answer. I would like to, to indicate why I think that, um, um, that the more ambitious target, the 280 ppm, um, is less, uh, uh, well, kind of less dangerous, that we do not cross any tipping points there, and um, the reason is that I doubt that, that it makes sense of, um, of speaking of tipping points within socioeconomic systems. Um, so on the one hand, um, because the result of, results of socioeconomic um, reforms depend on human behavior, and we have here, here an opportunity for de deliberation and convincing others how to, well, how to behave, what to do. And social reforms do not lead to um, irreversible outcomes um, <coughs> uh, just because they um, um, can be changed. Um, and uh, finally, they, um, the outcomes of um, socioeconomic reforms become apparent in much shorter time than interventions with natural systems, so that we, we have more opportunities to, uh, to, to react to, to these results. But um, as mentioned, these are rather hints um, uh, or other ideas um, of the direction in which I'm thinking in order to, uh, to make the point that the uh, more ambitious um, uh, greenhouse gases target is uh, justified.
Thanks a lot so far. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.